um, and great to be back. And thanks for joining again. If you if you didn't uh, hear the first lecture, uh, I'm only going to recap a little bit. Some of the themes will come up again. I mentioned that in the three talks, we'll be circling back. And uh, we are kind of circling and weaving a bit today. I want to finish up. I want to take one step that I didn't get to in the last talk uh, that will then segue us into the figure. But I want to stay in the synagogue where we were uh, last week looking at a long history of of ritual, uh, of ritual art. And we looked at uh, relief work from antiquity, from the Middle Ages, uh, not monumental, but still uh, interesting, significant, occasionally beautiful, and uh, mostly unknown to both Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. So I think it's, it's kind of fun to bring attention to this aspect of Jewish expression, uh, Jewish visual expression, um, that that doesn't get the kind of attention that even uh, painting uh, gets. Uh, we talk about synagogue architecture a lot because we all think of the synagogue as a place, but it's also richly adorned. So what I want to do today is just uh, begin with um, a segue where we see how we move from the from the ornaments that decorated the Torah, and we saw some of those last week, the breastplates, the crowns, the rimonim, the yads, uh, all of which were often embellished with sculptural details, you know, the hand, the finger pointing on the yad, or the little uh, animals, the lions, the deer around the Torah crown that we saw. And we're going to see how that kind of spreads uh, in the 20th century, begins to spread out into the building itself. Um, before that time, before the interwar years, uh, the 30s, uh, and then especially after World War II, the decoration in the synagogue was mostly applied um, with two-dimensional art, if there was art at all. So painting, uh, mosaics, sometimes in the floor, definitely in antiquity, and then beginning in the 19th century, a lot of stained glass. Uh, we didn't see too much sculpture inside, uh, and we didn't see any on the outside either. That begins to change, and so let me uh, start moving through uh, a few images, and we'll get to that place where there's a dramatic um, shift in Jewish sensibilities toward uh, three-dimensional art, whether representational or uh, abstract, okay? Some of you may be thinking of examples you know from your own synagogues. Uh, if you're in a synagogue that was built after 1950, uh, it's very likely there is some sculpture in your, in your uh, religious home. So, um, we talked last time, you don't have to read this whole quote, but I'm reminding you uh, we talked about going way back to the origins of Jewish art and architecture with the description of the tabernacle in the book of Exodus and the Temple of Solomon in the book of Kings, how there's a description of the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant, um, the so-called mercy seat or the kaparot. And um, then in the Temple of Solomon, we get a description of these bulls, these brazen uh, bronze bulls supporting uh, a giant uh, ritual purification basin out in the in the uh, outside of the temple proper. Um, just keep that in mind because what we find when we jump into the 20th century, really almost three millennia later, um, is we get um, and here are those images that I showed last week. And of course, most of you know all of this from Indiana Jones, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, but that image actually is taken from uh, scores of similar images that permeated uh, the, the Christian world, uh, not so much the Jewish world, but the Christian world uh, in the, from the 19th and into the 20th century. Here's a painting by Tissot. Um, but um, th these images uh, of the cherubim um, get picked up uh, by the first Israeli, no, first not Israeli, first uh, at that time Palestinian or Jewish uh, uh, movement back in Eretz Israel in the early 19th century, uh, in the early days of Zionism, when a sculptor named Baruch Schatz founds an art school, the Betzalel School of Art, 
um, named after Betzalel, the maker of that first tabernacle and the maker of the ark with cherubim. And here we see one of the first projects that um, Schatz uh, embarks upon as a collaborative project of many, many students in different media uh, is the creation of a portable uh, ark um, that would represent uh, their new skills in metalworking, in enamel, um, and, and several other uh, media. Uh, and the arc, uh, it is very sculptural. So this is at the time, up to this time, um, it is um, the first uh, really of its kind, although it harks back to those carved arcs that we saw from, from Poland. But this is, this is in metal. And uh, I want you to note the, the cherubim, these almost Art Nouveau cherubim uh, with their wings spread, uh, flanking the, um, these beautiful uh, glass and metal uh, or enamel um, uh, uh, Ten Commandments up, up at the top. Uh, and then the rest of it is also beautifully, beautifully decorated. Um, this leads us into uh, a whole century, if you will, through the 20th century, less so right now in the 21st when we've become more, um, we're favoring more austere designs, but we begin getting more and more ornate, but uh, arcs that are often decorated with these old themes. And, and my favorite, so I'm going to jump to um, a synagogue that's in, in Fairmont, um, in um, Cleveland, uh, designed by Percival Goodman, in uh, the early uh, 50s, uh, it was decorated by a sculptor who, who you should know, uh, a Jewish sculptor, Ibram Lasso, um, who does a lot of the sculpture. And you can see these sort of abstract uh, uh, reliefs around the side, which represent uh, the sort of cosmic uh, symbols, stars and suns and lot like the like, but over the ark proper, he has a giant sculpted uh, wing. It's a single, well, it's actually a double wing connected over a, a beaten uh, bronze, uh, a kind of a, uh, almost like a shell uh, with, with tendrils. Um, this is the sun, which actually is the near to me, the eternal light of the synagogue, uh, and then sheltering it. You can think about, um, you know, the sheltering wing, which we talk about in the prayers, the, the sheltering tent, the ohel uh, of peace, uh, but it's the wing of the cherubim still um, flanking, flanking the ark. In this case, though, it is a very modern take on the wing of the cherubim over a very modern type of, of uh, ark but um, it, it harks back to the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant in the, in the tabernacle of, of Exodus. So Lasso was one of many sculptors, um, abstract sculptors. They're part of the um, New York School of Abstract Expressionism that really took off in the late 40s and the 50s and early 60s. Um, uh, many of these sculptors came of age in the 1930s, working in the Works Progress Administration. Some of them started as uh, figurative sculptors, and we'll we'll look at that in a minute. Um, but after the war, they shifted to abstraction. Lasso, in fact, was one who started as an abstract sculptor with welded, uh, welded uh, metal forms. Uh, so he was very uh, early out of the gate, and we're going to come back to his work a little bit later. Another one of these artists was Herbert Ferber, uh, and again, you can see it seems entirely abstract. It's given the title, The Bush Was Not Consumed. This was um, also from the early 50s, also a synagogue designed by Percival Goodman, um, and it was uh, applied on the, on the outside of the building rather than uh, over the ark. Uh, a Goodman, who was the architect in Fairmont and in, in uh, Milburn, New Jersey, and in uh, several other places in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, he was the first architect to uh, routinely and consistently design for the inclusion of modern art in his buildings. And since he was the most prolific uh, American architect of the period, uh, that meant that there was a lot of work for 
uh, sculptors not, and, and, and also uh, uh, textile designers and, and uh, stained glass artists, uh, most of whom were Jew Jewish, not all, uh, but there was a lot of work for them um, filling these places or decorating these places. Uh, Goodman wasn't very uh, adamant about what he wanted, but he sort of chose the spaces that would be filled with art, and then he kind of left it to the artist to come up with the design. Um, and we have a whole a group of, of um, very accomplished artists, many of them abstract expressionists, uh, but working in uh, various materials, but the sculptor is working especially in metal, um, and, and they're creating uh, new forms uh, for old uh, types of ritual uh, furnishing. So here in Tulsa, we see uh, the, the artist Seymour Lipton uh, designing a, um, a, um, a Nair Tamid um, uh, out, of, out, of, out of metal. And then you also see this very expressive uh, menorah uh, off to the side. And here are some more of his works from uh, also a, from a Percival Goodman Design Synagogue in uh, Gary, Indiana, Temple Beth El. So Lipton mostly was known for his abstract sculpture that had nothing to do with Judaism. And he showed in major galleries and he's in the collection of pretty much every major museum in America today. Um, but you can see how a lot of the forms that he had in um, for his, for his non-religious um, work uh, is is very similar to what he he adapted to the synagogue, and that was true for for most of these most of these artists. Uh, Lassa, who we mentioned, um, was uh, uh, an expressionist working in metal. Uh, he created a version similar to what uh, Ferber did in 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 um, in New Jersey. Uh, this is in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, the original building on which it was applied, uh, which was built in the 1950s, burned down, and then it was rebuilt, but the sculpture survived. It was rebuilt in the 1970s, and, and this is um, a large uh, kind of an abstract work. It, you could see it as a tree. You could see it as flames. Uh, he, he describes it as a, named it a pillar of fire, uh, which represents the presence of the Lord over the tabernacle as described in Exodus. But he also did an air to meet inside and you can see a menorah here. So um, it was a kind of complete type of decoration. And interestingly, um, we talked about teaks uh, last week and here actually is an example of one of those teaks with, with embossed metalwork um, and but also a decorative uh, uh, crowns and, and uh, shields of the type we just talked about as well. So they're sitting in an arc uh, in this very traditional design, but under this uh, extraordinarily uh, new and different type of, of Nair Tamid above. Uh, now I'm gonna show you something that nobody has ever seen, uh, unless you're on uh, one or two Facebook pages. Um, my friend Brad Kolodny, who is the president of the recently founded Jewish Historical Society of Long Island sent me these this week. Uh, they were just uncovered. This, this huge relief work was just uncovered this week in the Merrick Jewish Center uh, in Merrick, uh, Long Island uh, in New York. And um, so here you see, this is actually in the foyer of the synagogue. The synagogue was probably built in 53 and this seems to be a remodeling maybe from 1960 because that's when the sculpture is dated. Um, we see a big relief. I don't know whether it's in concrete or plaster or carved in stone. I can't tell from the photos. Um, it has some mosaic inlay, uh, but it seems to include um, sort of a style of expressionism and cubism and symbolism. And I'm not sure yet what the meaning of it all, all is. It, it, it might refer to um, something from Exodus. We have or from Genesis. Here we have a figure, presumably at Mount Sinai, with the Decalogue. Uh, here, a figure that seems to be running from a city or a town, which suggests, you know, maybe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, but it could be something else. Um, there are different scenes, and, and we don't know. We still know very little about this work, um, but it is from 1960. So right in this period, uh, when synagogues are beginning to add uh, sculpture and, uh, uh, and, and, and new types of art uh, in, in different places of their, of their uh, complexes. 
Um, I want to show you this example that I visited just last December, uh, West Suburban Temple Harzine, just outside of Chicago in River Forest. Um, this building is remarkable for its stained glass windows in the social hall, which I'm only showing you the outside here. It could be a subject in another talk another time, designed by the American, well-known American artist, William Gropper. And these are absolutely stunning. And I'm hoping the congregation will do a book about them at some point. Um, but on the outside uh, of the synagogue uh, is a big piece of relief sculpture, uh, which is quite remarkable because it's the first, one of the first um, sculptures applied to a modern suburban sort of post-war synagogue, but it's also the first um, that overtly includes a human form. Even though the human form is somewhat distorted when you look at the face, um, this is meant to be um, uh, you know, a, a prophetic a representation and the, uh, the sculpture is called Not by Might, Not by Power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Um, and it comes from um, uh, that, let's go back here. Um, and, and we, and we see, and we see a detail of it here. Um, this, this really shook up a lot of people, um, because, I mean, there's still people who were obsessed with this idea that Jews can't make figural art, uh, or figurative art, even though they, as we will see shortly, they've been doing it, you know, since the late 19th century. Um, but applying it to a synagogue also, you know, was difficult for some people. Um, but generally, uh, the reception was very was very positive. Um, that it was it, that it, it it was a bold work of of art, and it, it, it kind of brought attention um, to the to the building, and it also uh, conveyed a particular uh, message. The sculptor was um, Milton Horn, who. Uh, was an Im immigrant like many of the Jewish sculptors of his generation. He came as a child, um, and um, uh, he uh, created works in several other synagogues too. Uh, this is in Charleston, West Virginia, Temple Israel, and it's actually the Ark. So here we see the figures moving from the outside of the synagogue, which was... Um, Shocking enough for many people, but then here we see it moving uh, inside onto the ark, which also was um, was somewhat shocking to 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 more traditional Jews. In fact, I know of two other arks from the 1930s. One at um, Great Neck, um, uh, Long Island, New York, and one in um, uh, Kenneth Israel in Philadelphia at Elkins Park, uh, which, which also had figurative scenes on their arcs. So this was not entirely new. And in a minute, we're going to look at the arc um, at uh, Brith Kodesh in, in, in uh, uh, Rochester, New York. Um, but you can see that it, it, this reflects a, a, change in, a change in attitude. No one is worried that these are I these are reform congregations, um, the ones that are having the figures uh, inside. Um, and they're not worried that these are idolaters in any way. They, they're meant to be uh, either um, uh, inspirational or narrative. Um, and, and they usually uh, uh, reflect some, some aspect of the life of Moses, Moses receiving the Torah, uh, as a surrogate for all of the people of Israel, for the congregation. And uh, in this case, we have uh, Moses receiving the law, but we also have um, uh, the cherubim here shown on the right over the original ark. And we have uh, the menorah, which would have been a sign, which was built and designed by Bethsalel. And it's mentioned in, the, in Exodus as one of the essential furnishings of the tabernacle. And then this of course, is repeated uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. We have the hand of God coming down, which is perhaps the most uh, dramatic or radical uh, element. Um, that, uh, but it, but it, but it essentially is informing the congregation of what is within the doors of the of the uh, Aron, the cabinet, uh, and where they will find the the, the Sefer Torah with the words. Uh, given to Moses on 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 Sinai, so it's it's kind of a setup. It's a big setup for the big event, and in that way, it's no different than the breastplates 
the shields that we saw on the Torahs from the 18th century uh, with Moses and Aaron uh, on as, as full figures. It's just that now on the front of this ark and Milton Horn's ark, uh, they're front and center. This is carved in wood. And I want you to keep that in mind because we're gonna look at some more wood carving. Uh, wood carving seemed to have been very special to um, many Jewish artists in, um, in the 20th century. And I think even today somewhat, uh, but it harks back to a kind of tradition of craftsmanship that goes back to those wooden synagogues that we saw last week uh, from the 18th century, uh, Druya and places like that, where all the animals and, and the flowers and uh, you know intricate patterns were carved uh, one, two, three story, stories high in a very dramatic uh, form. Uh, this, this tradition of wood carving, as opposed to a kind of more formal uh, stone sculpture, uh, like, like, you know, in the Roman tradition or in the uh, Beaux-Arts tradition from Paris, uh, you know, stays very, um, remains very strong among, among Jewish artists. Uh, in the same way, if we were talking about uh, two-dimensional art, the graphic qualities of, of the Hebrew alphabet uh, always remain strong with Jewish painters and printers and others. I think of Ben Shawn especially, but there are many others, um, even when they are moving away from strictly religious art or moving away from a strictly uh, religious environment into a more secular and public uh, sphere, um, these, these traditions stay strong. And I think the wood carving is, uh, is important in, uh, in looking at a lot of uh, a Jewish sculpture of the of the modern era, in one sense, to me, as I think about it, it brings something very Jewish, even though it's would be folk art from any place, from Romania or or Ukraine or Lithuania, um, um, and it doesn't mean that Jews are not going to follow more institutional and traditional uh, trends uh, and learn about stone sculpture and classical sculpture and bronze casting, but there is something special always about the wood carving. Uh, too, and we see it in Milton Horn's uh, work especially. Um, so the the synagogue um, from where the uh, the first 1950 Horn relief is in River Forest was designed by the architects, Jewish architects, uh, Lobel Schlossman and uh, in Bennett. Uh, the the third architect keeps changing a bit, but they continue. Lobel and Schlossman continue uh, for many decades as prominent architects in Chicago, and they build many synagogues. Um, they designed the Loop Synagogue uh, downtown, and I spoke about the Loop Synagogue, I believe, when I gave my synagogue architecture lectures last year or two years ago, whenever. Uh, and you'll remember this wall that you're looking at is, an, is a stunning stained glass window by the uh, Jewish artist Abraham Ratner, and um, very important, but we'll talk about that maybe another time. Uh, I want you to note the... Um, the sculpture that is on the front of the building by uh, Nehemi Azaz, who um, is um, Israeli and uh, French, uh, and, and uh, it's called The Hands of Peace. And it's an interesting work because it includes the hands. We already saw the hand of God coming down on the ark by Milton Horn. These are blessing hands. And then we have the entire uh, text in Hebrew and in uh, English of the um, uh, Lord bless thee and keep thee and Lord make his face to shine upon thee and give thee peace. Essentially the, the blessing, the priestly blessing or the blessing given by the rabbi today uh, at the end of, at the end of, uh, of uh, uh, services. Um, the, the, um, but it's, it's interesting because the Loop Synagogue was considered a synagogue for Chicago. And for Jews coming from all over the country who were coming for business in Chicago. And that was a lot of people. So at one time, the membership uh, in the Loop Synagogue, membership was like joining a club. You, it was only, it wasn't a lot of money, uh, but this is a place you could come to pray, come for services, come for a minion. Uh, anytime you were in Chicago, uh, the, it was in the thousands. I think it was as many as 8,000, I'm not sure. Uh, today it's much much smaller and so they're having financial difficulties. 
Um, but these blessing hands, um, which are figurative, but you see that the importance of text is, is, is extremely um, you know, prominent. Um, these are blessing not just the Jews coming into the building, but essentially they're blessing Chicago. It's, it's, a, it's a way of, of, of engaging, the synagogue engaging with the city around it. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, um, image for the way Jews saw themselves in the 1950s and 1960s uh, engaging with uh, all aspects of American society. Sad to say Jews have, many Jewish communities have retreated. They've now built their synagogues far away from other areas. They, 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 they're not, they don't face streets. You have to drive to a back entrance. They're in the woods, they're in the fields, uh, or they're in enclosed campuses like in Austin or in Baltimore, other places where, where Jews only engage other Jews, which is great, but they're not they're not presenting themselves as part of the, the larger society. It's a new Fairmont, Fairmont and Beechwood in Cleveland, good examples where Jews have, you know, kind of get self ghettoized. Um, but this, the Loop Synagogue was the opposite. They, it was really about engaging. And it was an Orthodox synagogue, but it was an American Orthodox synagogue. Uh, it could be both. You didn't have to choose to be, between being an observant Jew and a patriotic and engaged. American in civic affairs, business affairs, social affairs, and so on. Um, Azaz also did the ark on the inside, and you can see that here the decoration is in primarily uh, about the um, about the text. So um, we see that, and it's the prayers. Um, uh, I think it's the Olenu, isn't it? I forget, I forget what it is. Uh, um, but uh, these are these are part of part of the design, and um, whereas Ratner's window behind includes texts and symbols, but no but no figures, no figures. Um, very different is the uh, roughly contemporary uh, arc, so called the Ark of Revelation, that was designed by the artist Louise Cache for the Brith Kodesh Synagogue in Rochester. New York, which was designed by the noted architect Pietro Belushi, uh, who Belushi would be an Italian, who was a leading modernist, but he was also somewhat of an expressionist too. And when he left the Pacific Northwest, where he was very well known for his buildings using redwood, um, he he came came east to be dean of architecture at MIT. And he began to design a lot of churches and synagogues on the East Coast. Uh, they used some of the same aesthetic and the same materials, um, but they but they evolved somewhat differently as well. Uh, in all, Belushi did five synagogues, but Brith Kodesh is the largest and I think the most impressive. It has this giant dome um, on these ribs, and uh, when I took the, when these pictures were taken uh, many years ago by my friend Paul Rochely for the book we did on American synagogues 20 years ago, uh, there were problems with the lighting. So part of these lights around the window, the oculus were gone, so it looks a little strange, uh, but you can see how the dome um, frames this enormous bronze uh, arc. And uh, then there are 12 panels. Originally, uh, the architect, envisioned that the 12 panels themselves would be decorated with reliefs that would represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the sculptor Louise Cache was sort of engaged in discussions whether that was possible. Um, she was a young woman at the time. This is extraordinary that so in, someone so young, she was in her early uh, 30s, I think. Uh, she was born in 1925, and this is, um, maybe she was in her early 40s. Um, that she should be doing this work, uh, but that she, that a woman would be doing this work is really extraordinary. But as a graduate school student at uh, Syracuse University, where I am, where I teach, um, Louise uh, was a prize student of the uh, great sculptor Ivan Mestrovich, who we will mention later, to, uh, next week. And um, she did great work under Mestrovich, but she and her husband, Mort Keish, um, befriended uh, first Rabbi Benjamin Friedman here in Syracuse, and then later um, Philip Bernstein in, 
in Rochester, and they uh, they actually got jobs doing designing department store windows in Rochester. And when they were there, they joined Brith Kodesh, and um, Rabbi Bernstein just fell in love with this young couple. Um, Louise got several fellowships to go and work in Europe, and she went to Italy and to learn uh, sculpture, more sculpture, more about bronze casting, and to look at the old masters. And Rabbi Bernstein, on a return trip from uh, Israel, stopped to see her in Florence, and he saw these incredible little models that she was doing of the prophets and other biblical characters. And he was so, um, so in, fell so in love with these that he promised that she, she was going to design the, uh, at that time, they were going to be the doors for the new synagogue that he was just uh, beginning to raise money for in Rochester. Eventually, those doors morph into an ark. And Louise wasn't entirely comfortable about this, but the rabbi forged ahead. And you can see in the ark here that it does have the form sort of of two doors, which are then linked by a, a lintel or a cross uh, a panel, which has the, the eternal uh, light. Um, the figures are based on a whole series of smaller bronzes that I mentioned she was working on. These are these are two, Jacob uh, wrestling with the angel and then Moses uh, receiving the, uh, the, the commandments, uh, but there, there are many more. And um, uh, then they, they were expressed as, uh, as reliefs in these big bronze uh, uh, panels. Louise was a tiny woman. I knew her and um, uh, I loved her. She's a wonderful woman and a wonderful artist. Uh, so, you know, she was this tiny woman working in this studio with these enormous, doing this first in, in clay and then in plaster, these enormous uh, uh, panels. Um, and um, I don't think I have a picture of her in her studio here, but uh, during the pandemic, a beautiful new monograph on her work was uh, published, um, just called Louise Cache, uh, An American Art Legacy. And I, I do have a chapter that I wrote about these, this arc and some of her other religious work, but there's a great picture of her in her New York City studio uh, with this towering uh, work uh, behind her. Uh, so it was um, done with a, uh, uh, a very high relief, but some of it's lower relief. And, and it's very, you can feel her hand sort of uh, modeling the clay and the, then the, the, in the plaster and then in the bronze. Uh, and that kind of conveys an expressive force that is, that is really quite um, strong. Uh, it doesn't have any of the polish of of um, of academic sculpture, uh, even though she she certainly had that training. And here we see two. I think this is Isaiah on the on the right, um, and then Moses on the left. And you can see this this ecstasy of the figures, but you also get the sense of a kind of divine wind, a voice, you know, that is that is pushing through them. Uh, that 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 we hear. Um, I just will show this work. This is, uh, I see this almost every day when I go to teach. Uh, this is a work that Louise did as a graduate student. Um, uh, and it was, it's called the Saltine Warrior. At that time, the, the, uh, the mascot of Syracuse University was the Saltine Warrior, not a politically correct, uh, uh, not a politically correct mascot. But when Louise was commissioned to make this sculpture because Mestrovich was too busy, they'd asked Mestrovich and he couldn't do it. So he said, uh, have Louise do it. Uh, she, she actually, there was a co competition among his students and she was the best and he, he, you know, she was chosen. Uh, she actually spent a lot of time with the Onondaga nation uh, and uh, an Onondaga uh, young man was the model for this uh, statue. And uh, it, it, it um, it's a really dynamic and very strong, uh, strong image. But if you go back, you can almost feel the kind of energy. This is from, I think, the early 50s. And then this is from, from later. You can feel that dynamic energy in the Moses figure of, of, of Rochester. I love these works very much. And uh, I feel that more people should know uh, about the work of, of Louise Cage. I think she was one of the great sculptors in America of the second half of the 20th century. And I, and I do think that this art is, is, is certainly one of the great works of, of Judaic or Jude, Jewish art um, of, of, 
of the last 50 years, or actually it's more than 50 years, it's almost 60 years uh, as, 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 as well. Okay, so now when you're looking at figures, we saw figures with Milton Horn, we saw figures with Louise Cache. Um, when did you start feeling comfortable carving figures? Well, we can take it back probably to a, a, a Jewish artist in Russia, in Imperial Russia. Uh, he was actually born in, in Vilna, uh, Lithuania, well, then Poland, but now Lithuania. Uh, uh, and this is Mark Antokolsky. Uh, There's actually a street named for him in Vilna today uh, in the area of the old uh, Jewish quarter. And he uh, was academically trained uh, something very rare for Jews in the in the mid to late 19th century. Jews were beginning to be trained in painting at the academies, but and in architecture a little bit by the late 19th century, uh, but not so much in sculpture. So uh, Antokolsky uh, was one of the first, but he also uh, established himself very quickly as one of the best sculptors in Russia. So he became a favorite sculptor of the imperial court, and he was commissioned by churches and by many other people to do a lot of a lot of work. Um, some of his work is um, his early work actually derives on his sort of Jewish roots, and it's it's both um, uh, nostalgic and and ethnographic and descriptive. Um, you know, in some ways, it's it's it's. Um, uh, I wouldn't say it's 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 it denigrates Jews, but it 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 shows them as as working people, as 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 characters. And this is something that Russian artists and actually European artists across all countries were doing, uh, not just of Jews, but of washerwomen, of beggars, of of um, farmers, anybody. Uh, you, you know, it was a kind of a, a a realism, but it was also a realism that was so heightened that it that it suggested a type of stereotyping and, and, and caricature. Um, these are in wood and they're so finely carved. And again, this is this wood carving uh, tradition. But he also worked in stone and in uh, bronze, would have done these in plaster. Um, and uh, some of his works actually have Jewish themes. Uh, the, he did a work in marble from 1882 of Spinoza, the, the <laughs> excommunicated, uh, if you will, philosopher, a Jewish philosopher. Um, and then his Jesus here, uh, done in 1874, which was originally in marble, this is a bronze copy, is is often uh, cited as one of the first so-called Jewish Jesuses. It, it, he, he, he really um, um, evokes a, 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 a Jewish man in, in both the, the appearance and in the garb. Um, but not too much, not too much, so that Christians would be uh, put off by it. Uh, this is a whole, a whole genre, the Jewish Jesus, that that Jewish artists will embrace uh, for the next fifty years, or no more, a hundred years. Um, some of you know Chagall's uh, White Crucifix that he did in 1938 uh, as a, a, about, about the Holocaust. But but there are many, many uh, manifestations of this. And sometimes they were done actually for Jewish, for Christian clients, and sometimes they were done for themselves as a political and social uh, statement uh, about how, uh, uh, you know, emphasizing the, the Jewish origins of, of, of Jesus. Um, there's a lot of Antokolsky's work, um, and we're not going to go into it, but his influence was very strong. Uh, this is his grave, uh, or was his grave? I, I I don't know if it still stands. This is a, I think it does. This is an old older photo uh, in the um, Jewish cemetery in Saint Petersburg, and you see how elaborate it is. He was highly celebrated in his lifetime, and uh, received many many honors. Now, there's an equivalent to Antokolsky in America, a man named Moses Jacob Ezekiel, and Ezekiel. Um, uh, was a Southerner. He was born in um, Richmond, I think. Yeah, born in Richmond. He fought as a very young man, really just as a teenager, uh, at the end of the uh, Civil War on the side of the South. And he's he's not very popular these days uh, for political reasons because he was unrepentant in promoting the lost cause um, mythology and ideology of the South. 
uh, and he he uh, was the creator of many monuments to Southern uh, Confederate heroes, including the big monument in Arlington Cemetery. Um, but he also did a number of Jewish works, and he was a friend of Isaac Mayer Wise, and he did a, a very famous sculpted portrait of Wise, and and um, you know he was he was uh, remarkably successful in his lifetime and held in high esteem for quite a long time. Um, when it comes to Jewish artists, uh, until recently, Ezekiel was one of the few whose names would come up uh, more broadly in in uh, the in art history. Looking at his work today, it seems somewhat dated, somewhat kitschy, uh, derivative. You know, it's not it's not what it's 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 you know it's not what people run out to to see, um, and it's more interesting for its subject matter and for the historical setting in which it was made and which it was exhibited. Um, this resonates today. My friend Samantha Baskin uh, was to have a an exhibition at Princeton University on um, on J Jewish artists, um, and. Uh, she had, there were a couple works by Ezekiel and she was asked to remove them by the now, my own alma mater, the so politically correct um, Princeton, that uh, that she refused to do the exhibition. Um, why they couldn't show the works and put them in their context. I mean, Princeton, I studied history at Princeton. Talk about the history, talk about what this means and what Ezekiel represented and what these works represented. Uh, but 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 no, and I may be simplifying the controversy because I wasn't personally involved. But it was it was somewhat shocking. Um, Samantha is working on a book about Ezekiel, which I uh, eagerly await because I think it will explain a lot about um, why we should or should not think about his his work today. But one of his most uh, significant works for us is this relief called Israel, and it's now at Hebrew Union College uh, at the at the museum in in Cleveland. If you ever get there to see it. Uh, also, Isaac Mayer Wise Bust is there. And um, it's important because uh, for me, it's this rising figure of, uh, of a resurgent Israel. So this is 1904. This is, you know, the period of, uh, of Zionism. And, um, uh, but it's a very Christ-like, very Christ-like figure. Um, so it, it links the, to the Jewish, Jewish Jesus. Um, and you can, I, uh, Louise said she didn't know this work, but you know the her her expression for her Moses, you know, is so closely related to it. It's just it's just that how many how many ways can you can you uh, represent exaltation? And 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 in this case, you know, the outstretched arms are very important. Today, Ezekiel's best known work is this one called Religious Liberty. And that uh, was made in 1876, although it wasn't finished in time for the Philadelphia uh, Centennial celebrations. And it was be appropriate right there in Philadelphia, the birthplace of liberty. Uh, today, it has been moved from its location in Fairmont Park and it's on Independence Mall right in front of the National Museum of Jewish History. Um, so it's it has it's it's once again very prominent. Um, you know, it's very 19th century uh, in its symbolism and its uh, form and its representation. Um, and 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 uh, it, you know, it's more uh, I think historically interesting than artistically significant. But um, these are the these are the some of the works that get um, Ezekiel in trouble today. Virginia mourning her dead. Uh, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, he did a lot of these works, um, and and uh, I, I don't know whether any of these have been torn down yet. But it's you know they, they might be they might they might be torn down at some point. Now I mentioned Bara Schatz before. Bara Schatz um, was uh, the founder of the Betzalel School, but before he went to Palestine uh, as a Zionist, he was a a uh, prominent sculptor in his native Bulgaria. He was actually, you know, kind of the sculptor to the royal court. So he was similar to Antokolsky in Russia. He had this high status. Um, but we're just going to look at some of the work that he did uh, later in the 90s and early 1900s uh, when he turns to Jewish themes. 
And uh, what he tries to do is uh, give heroic monumental form, even when the figures were not all that big, because some of these are just maquettes, they're just models, to, uh, to Jewish themes. And some of these look like bronze, but many of them are plaster that are painted to look like bronze because he couldn't afford bronze uh, working in, in uh, Palestine in, in 1905. Um, so this one on the left I think is zinc, uh, and I think it's cast from plaster. And the other, I think, is plaster. Yes, it's plaster that's been painted. Um, I recently was at uh, the synagogue, Rodolf Sholom in, in uh, Pittsburgh, and I walked around the, the the school wing and the education. I said, oh my gosh, you've got all these Barashat's reliefs. That's amazing. It's amazing. And someone had brought them all back from, from uh, Palestine, I mean, probably in the 1920s or something like that. The, the synagogue was built, I think, in 1904. Um, but closer look showed me that they were all plaster and they were all painted to look like bronze. And uh, that means that he could have made many, many copies of these reliefs of biblical characters. So many synagogues around the world might have them. Uh, they, I don't think they've been, been traced uh, yet. Um, so this is uh, Judith. And we saw Judith as the heroic figure on Hanukkah menorahs from Italy last time. And then again, here's Matthias, the, the father of Judah Maccabee, holding a big knife like Abraham with the sacrifice. Uh, but he's um, he's got some poor Greek at his feet. And he's got his arms spread again in that sort of um, that that uh, type of exaltation that we saw for Moses and that we saw in that figure of Israel. Um, so here's a comparison of those figures as we move forward. Uh, another of these Zionist artists um, was a guy named Alfred Nozig, uh, and he also was creating heroic figures. Here we have uh, Judah Maccabee, so the son of Matatias, as a heroic figure with a sword moving forward. Most of these have been lost, so we only have old photographs. And I recommend the book by, um, by Richard Cohen called uh, Jewish Icons, which is a terrific book, and it describes and discusses many of these works. Um, and then this picture of the wandering Jew. The wandering Jew, which had been a figure of derision and anti-Semitism uh, in the 19th century. Some of you may know the Gustave Doré, a uh, print of of the wandering Jew, which is very uh, anti-Semitic in its in its representation. Um, so Nosik is kind of giving the wandering Jew a more noble uh, mane, and he's carrying a Torah, and he's he's real like a rabbi. Keep this in mind because we will see these types of representations when we look at Holocaust uh, memorials next next week. Um, sadly, Nosik, you see, he died in 1943. He lived too long. He was almost uh, he was he was he was quite old, um, but he came to a to a ignominious end. He was in the Warsaw Ghetto um, and uh, was accused of collaboration. He was on the on the council of, because he was a distinguished man, quite reputation, uh, and he was executed by fellow Jews by the fighters uh, for his for his. Uh, uh, collaboration or his complacency uh, with uh, about about German actions. So this man who had championed Jewish independence and Jewish uh, uh, heroism and 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 in dynamic art forms um, himself fell victim to this same uh, same ideology of, of of heroic Judaism because he couldn't he didn't live up to that to that. Um, there were many other sculptors, and they're not so well known. A lot of their work doesn't survive. Many of them are being discovered and studied in Israel today. There have been a number of exhibitions at the Israel Museum and other places. Uh, one is Henrik Lichtenstein, who was uh, Polish. He was born in Turek, Poland. Uh, he was known as Enrico Lichtenstein because he, he, he lived in Italy for a while and then came to the United States in 1928. So he, too, was making these works, Bar Kokhba in 1906, and then a work called Messiah, but it's not the Christian Messiah, it's the Jewish Messiah with the shield, with the star, uh, star of David, the shield of David. Uh, he's the descendant of David, and he's awaiting, basically awaiting uh, his, his moment there. Um, and then Jules Butinsky, um, who also came to America, emigrated to the U.S. He was uh, uh, studied in Vienna, and Budapest in Vienna, and he... Um, 
is best known for this work on the right universal peace, which is this figure uh, beating a sword into a plowshare. Um, and he did several other Jewish themed works, Hillel and Shammai, which is on the left. So these are um, inspired by the Zionist artists, and he's essentially of that time, uh, second generation. So he would be a young man when the first uh, wave of Zionism took place. Uh, and he's uh, academically trained though, so he has the lessons of, uh, of essentially the Renaissance, the Baroque, uh, the 19th century Beaux-Arts tradition all behind him and he's able to translate that into sculpture. So one of these is uh, I think at the UN, um, I probably have it here, um, and one's at the, uh, I think there, uh, this one here, Exile, there's a cast, or there was a cast at the, at the uh, White House. Um, this work uh, from 1915 is a, a sculptural representation of one of the most common themes for socially conscious Jewish artists in the late 19th, early 20th century. It was about the pogroms in Eastern Europe and uh, exile, usually uh, emigration to America. And we have, you know, scores and scores of works by many, many really terrific artists. And I just show by comparison, um, this is a work by my mother, uh, who was a sculptor and painter. Uh, it's somewhat later, it's 1942, but it was done during the war. Um, uh, and she was just 22 when she did this, uh, but it still survives. And it's now in the collection of the National Museum of American Jewish History in Philadelphia, that same museum in which the, um, the Statue of Religious Liberty stands, uh, stands in front. So, um, let me just check the time here. I think my alarm's gonna go in two minutes. That will mean we're at 45 minutes maybe. Um, but I wanna quickly run through a few other artists. I won't give you a lot of detail, just to give you the variety because there were so many Jewish artists and their names are not well known. But if you go and look in museum collections, you'll often find them, but it won't say they're Jewish. It'll say they're Polish or Russian. Um, and the biographies are often extremely misleading. Uh, Ibram Lassau, for instance, who we mentioned before, the one who did the Pillar of Smoke and did the, he's often described as Egyptian, uh, Russian, Egyptian, because he was, his parents were Russian refugees from the pogroms, and then they lived briefly in Alexandria, Egypt, where he was born, and then eventually they came to America. But the, the key factor is they were Jewish, which is why they were moving around so much. But if you look in Wikipedia and you look in other places, you know, that may not, not show up. So Ellie Nadelman, very interesting artist. Uh, I don't know if any religious work or, or, or overtly Jewish work, uh, but he, he was Jewish from Warsaw. He came to America in, um, and became extremely influenced by American folk art. So uh, his, his work is often shown in conjunction with, uh, with folk art, but he was a highly accomplished modernist um, uh, Jack Lipschitz, of course, very important, um, and we can talk about him a little bit when we deal with a little bit more with abstraction uh, next week, too. Uh, Lipschitz uh, was born in Lithuania and uh, also a modernist influenced by Cubism and by Expressionism, and we see that in uh, works like Jacob and the Angel, and you see he's working in clay, and then it translates into bronze. Um, and uh, the work I want to bring to your attention, we'll come back to next week, is the David and Goliath, which is one of the first pieces of sculpture, maybe the first that I know that is explicitly anti-Nazi. Um, so it's just at the beginning of the Nazi regime, and we don't know what's going to happen, uh, but he already creates David and Goliath. Goliath has the swastika on him, and this is, uh, you know, this is an early, an early protest work. Uh, but this type of struggle and, and, and uh, uh, theme is one that he likes because of the dynamic energy it gives to the sculptural form. And so it's convenient to have David and Goliath, but essentially the same energy is in this Theseus and the Minotaur uh, from 1942. So this is 10 years later almost. This is, we're well into the war. This could be a war theme. It could be a, 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 a Holocaust theme. But is it? It's not clear. Is this symbolic? Is the Minotaur uh, 
uh, the Nazis, uh, just like Goliath was a Nazi, um, we, we, we don't know. Um, and in England, um, uh, Jacob Epstein, um, also a modernist, influenced by Cubism, uh, but expressing it very differently than Lipschitz. Um, best known work today is probably the tomb of, of Oscar Wilde in, in Paris's Père Lachaise uh, uh, Cemetery. Uh, it, it's a big pilgrimage site. They've had to, they've had to put a plexiglass around it to protect it because people kind of kiss it and put chewing gum, all sorts of things. There are all sorts of symbolic acts, which are the guidebooks tell people, oh, you should do this, do this. Um, amazing form. I've written a blog post about this, which goes into much more detail, inspired by the cherubim, but through Egypt, through Assyria, also by angels, like wind victory figures. And this is obviously a tomb, so it's victory over death. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's one of uh, his monumental works. Epstein was actually a rare instance of a Jewish artist. He was born in America, in New York, to immigrant parents. Um, he started as a graphic artist. He was trained at the settlement houses in New York. And then he moves to France. And then he moves to London. So already as a young man in his early 20s, he's, he's in London. He spends the rest of his career in England and becomes the most famous sculptor uh, of the 20th century, probably, in England. After, and then along with Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth and a few others. Um, but his, his monumental work was very strong, very influenced by ancient forms. Um, and it was kind of a response or reaction, maybe even a rejection of classical norms. Uh, these are two big works, Night and Day, that are on a building uh, in London. And obviously they're very different from Michelangelo's Night and Day, which he would have known. And this is sort of a Pieta pig figure. Um, but it's very different in its massiveness, its roughness, its, its rawness to, to Michelangelo's design. Um, so curiously, when we go forward and look at World War I monuments and then Holocaust monuments, um, which we'll see next week, it's the, the style of Epstein, not Michelangelo, which will prevail. That kind of uh, raw energy of, 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 uh, of power and sorrow and suffering. All right, let me just end up with a few here. Uh, more, more, um, uh, a few representations. Epstein continued to be the the epitome of the Bohemian artist through his whole life. His, there's a there's a great biography of him. Um, uh, it's got a very wild title. I forget what it is, but um, it, it was is an amazing life. I mean, it, 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 there should be movies about Jacob Epstein. Um, but at the same time, while he was a radical and a Bohemian. He was also became the favored portrait artist, not just for Jews. And here are three very famous Jews, the artist Jacob Kramer, Albert Einstein, and Chaim Weizmann, but also of the English elite, of prime ministers, of writers, of artists, uh, of aristocrats. So he, he sort of, he had tons of work and he could model these, he modeled these in clay so fast. He could do this in a day. And then they were cast in bronze. Uh, so he had a good lucrative career. <laughs> going forward. Um, these are two works that actually kind of call on Jewish themes. Uh, he did a few. Uh, this is the burial of Abel, a small work, only about this high in bronze, very expressive. Um, and then this work, which I grew up with in Philadelphia, uh, it's just been moved from the Philadelphia Art Museum to the University of Pennsylvania, but it's called Social Consciousness. And I never understood it when I was a kid. I used to walk past it all the time. Um, but it's, it's about, um, it's actually an optimistic, it looks so, I always thought it was a Holocaust memorial. It seems so severe, but it's actually about a kind of optimism, but expressed through a kind of moral um, moral compass and, and uh, certainty. So it's, so it's, so it's very, uh, very solemn. Um, and then uh, he also did work for Christian clients like this, a uh, big work at Coventry Cathedral, one of his last from 1958. Okay, I think we should probably uh, wrap it up, don't you, Ari? About uh, for today. Yeah, I think. Um, let's just, and then uh, I'll I'll, I'll pick I'll pick up. I want to talk about a few. Go back. We'll, we'll begin next time just with some a little bit about the wood carvers because that segues. Then we'll come back to how these then get expressed in uh, Holocaust monuments. So. Ari said, maybe I'll show you some things from my recent travels. That's where some images will come in. 
And next week, we'll be looking at both uh, the figurative work of many sculptors, but as it's expressed for Holocaust commemoration, as it's used that way. And then we'll also look at a, a very big trend in uh, abstraction. We will not get into the anti-monument and conceptual art and different types of multimedia installations. Uh, that will be too much, but that is the most recent kind of uh, expression uh, for many sculptors who are Jewish and occasionally for some expressions of, of, of Jewish art. I probably shouldn't end on this picture of, uh, of um, I need to come back to something Jewish. <laughs> You'll see that all these guys are, all these people are doing um, universal themes. They like universal themes. Um, but, uh, but synagogues uh, continue to commission works and purchase works that are more specifically Jewish. Okay, so, so do we have time um, yeah. for some Q&A? Just, just very briefly. First of all, I wanted to say some of you had mentioned in your chats that, that some of the synagogues that you referenced were either their synagogue or that they've been to that synagogue, like the one in Loop. So if this was one of your synagogues that you've seen, that's great. My question to you, the first question is, do people in the synagogues understand the art that they have in their synagogues? And do they appreciate when you go visit as an outsider because you want to see their art? Are they impressed? Do they become more impressed with what they actually have in their synagogue or do they know what they have in there? Because I would tend to believe people have no idea what they've got. Yeah, in their generally synagogue. they do not know what they have because there's been such, in America, we're so transient and even just the generations change. So um, the people who are there now are not the people who commission these works. And also they're just not educated in these things. Rabbis today are mostly artistically illiterate um, and only a few are, many of whom I know, are, are, are intensely interested in the visual arts. Um, this idea that Jews don't make art or art doesn't matter to Jews is still being taught in seminaries and rabbis come out thinking that that's, that's the rule, that's the norm. And I have to show them stuff. I have to like lead them by the nose and expose them to say, and say, tell me, tell me <laughs> how you can still believe this when you see this and this and this and this and this. Um, and I do the same thing with congregations. Uh, a lot of the work that was done in mid-century, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more uh, with the Holocaust monuments, but some of those early works like Lassa and, 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 and Ferber and others, um, you know, people even today, you know, this idea, is it art or what does it mean? It's just, it just still continues um, 50, 60, 70 years later. That said, many congregations, have uh, brochures, have uh, videos. Um, the uh, the synagogue in in um, uh, where where the Milton Horn and uh, William Gropper art uh, is in in outside Chicago in River River Oaks. Um, they have a big program that really promotes and educates about their art, and they've made videos, and they're very proud about it, and they were very excited when I suggest. You guys should do a book because this is this is extraordinary work. And they they said, yeah, well, maybe we will. It's really good. Um, a beautiful book has been done, not about sculpture, but about the stained glass windows at at uh, Knesset Israel, just published by uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania Press about the stained glass windows designed by Jacob Landau. So I think you know it's kind of cyclical. People have it, they ignore it, but some people get interested and come around, and they and they get involved. Obviously, when I speak about it, if I go to a synagogue and speak about their art, it's often I've been invited because somebody there actually is interested in the art and wants to educate other people. And um, in the case of, of the Merrick Jewish Center, uh, they revealed this work. They know nothing about it. They don't know. Nobody knew about it. Nobody. Um, it probably was covered over by this mirror wall by the 1990s. But at least they're interested. They don't know whether to keep it. They don't know what to do with it. But they've reached out to people, including myself, to ask, what is it? Is it valuable? Should we keep it? You know, what should we do? Um, so, you know, there, there is hope. But I would say there's as much destruction as there is preservation. And, you know, that's just, that's just the way things go. Um, thanks. Rona. I mean, you can't cover every artist, but Rona asks, what about George Siegel, Leonard Baskin, 
yes. more contemporary artists. Uh, uh, George Siegel, I'll definitely be talking about next week. And Leonard Baskin, I actually had lined up. He was going to be the very end of this lecture today. I'm going to push him off till tomorrow. Um, he is the culmination, if you will, of that wood carving tradition that we saw begin with Antokolsky uh, and continue. So we'll so we'll look at some of the wood carvers, Chaim Gross and and Baskin and a few others at the beginning of the lecture. Um, Baskin does make work that is not explicitly uh, Holocaust commemorative, but it implies that. Um, and and we'll look at his big alt, so-called altar of uh, of Abraham and Isaac, especially one of my favorite artists, Leonard Baskin, for sure. Great. Last question for today, and that is. Um... You've done a whole series about synagogue architecture. You've mentioned stained glass. Now we have sculptures and sculptors. What is your act? What is your, your main focus? Because because there's so much. I mean, just in this lecture alone, you had so much material just on this one little subject. But if you had, if you were forced to choose, what is your passion really? I mean, what's your number one passion of these different areas of art? Oh, I can't say. My passion is what I'm learning about at the moment. Um, so when I gave you those lectures a few years ago um, about architecture, I was just getting interested in stained glass. And then during the pandemic, we've put together a working group of about 20 artists, architects, stained glass conservators, um, uh, archivists and others to explore the history of synagogue stained glass because nothing's been written about it. There's nothing there. And none of us, we all knew a little bit, but there was no place to go. So that became a big interest. And similarly with sculpture, um, I've been interested in sculpture for some time, but I think I got interested in sculpture because of my conversations with Louise Cache and writing that chapter, which came out during the pandemic. I think that's what put it into my head that I really need to know more about Jewish sculpture and Jewish sculptors. Um, and uh, let's see what I can pull together. And then when Ari asked, what would you like to talk about? <laughs> there you are. Um, you know, the only book that I know that really deals with American sculpture, uh, synagogue sculpture, it was written in 1965. And it's one short chapter in Avram Kampf's Contemporary Synagogue Art. Uh, some of these sculptors, like Ibram Lasso, there was a woman who did a doctoral dissertation which was never published a number of years ago. I'm in touch with the children of a lot of these artists. So I'm in touch with the children of Azaz. I'm in touch with the daughter of Lasso. I'm in touch with uh, the, the daughters of, uh, of, of an important sculptor in California. Other, so it's too late. To in, some of these people were interviewed in their, in their lives uh, and their oral histories, which I haven't heard sometimes, but they're in the archives of American art. But a lot of these people, um, they died, you know, within the last 20 years, but it's, but we lost our opportunity to really talk to them to get the story of their lives. And a lot of their archives are dispersed. We don't even have lists of all of their works. It's, it's really hard to find. So this is a kind of new frontier. So I'm encouraging my students, I'm encouraging other people to take a good look and uh, and to pay attention you know when you see something take a picture look it up <laughs> you know we'll get we'll, we'll get there hey right, thank you well thank you we mind unsharing for one second so we can just say thank you to everybody who was here today so um, can you unshare the screen for one second oh unshare sorry yes. about that um let me well, I, can't, I can't override I, you i don't think you that's can't me. override me oh that's dangerous that's dangerous. Well, I could figure it out. <laughs> if I had to. I figured. Anyway, I want to thank you all for joining us today uh, on this adventure into um, Jewish, um, the human form and Jew with Jewish artists. Some of it, uh, I assume some of it was new to many of you. Maybe some of you knew it all. I don't, I doubt it, but maybe you did. Either way, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gruber, for the program. Looking forward to the fi finale in our series next week and uh i see ed madros there from 
his uh, I don't know where he's coming from, but he's from you know he's associated with the with the uh, synagogue in um, in Chelsea that the Walnut Street synagogue that we are going to visit in our in our online series. So um, thank you all for joining us. And uh, when you go to your synagogue, if you're on the East Coast, take a look at the art there. Maybe you'll see something cool or ask yeah. a question as to what's there. Ari, you haven't yeah. muted me, so let me add one thing. Oh no, I forgot. Yes, to mute you you okay. can always if you have a question. If you can remember the email, samuelgruber at gmail.com. Um, but be sure to put in the subject line, you know, uh, CSP. CSP question about this. Or send it to Ari and he'll forward it to me. You may not get the response immediately, but I will get to it eventually. Okay. So I enjoy getting people's questions especially sometimes when I can't answer them because that gives me, you know, something new. A to new for. frontier to explore. A new frontier. But also information. As Ari said, if you have sculpture in your synagogues or you know of things, or if you're going to synagogues and museums now with a good smart camera with an iPhone or an Android, you can take fantastic pictures. Uh, take pictures. Send them to me. It would be great. It would be great. Yeah, I think I, Jeff Kaufman sent you some pictures from the South. Jeff Jeff sent me some great pictures, which some some of which we've already donated to the Index of Jewish Art at the Center for Jewish Art at Hebrew University. Right. So, if you know, if you don't mind your things going into larger databases and being used by researchers and scholars, yeah, send away. We can crowdsource a lot of this resource uh, research. And yeah, if anybody is near the Merrick, what's the name of the of the, it's the Merrick Merrick Jewish Center? It's a conservative synagogue in Merrick, uh, Long Island and sort of in the center of Long Island. Um, we actually, I've been talking with Brad Kolumny, the president of uh, the um, Long Island Jewish uh, Historical Society, and we're already partnering uh, to, um, in a survey of Holocaust memorials there as part of a larger project, which I'll, I'll try to mention next week. But I, I am now, now that Brad is interested because of this relief, in this sculpture and synagogue art, I will ask him and his members to to do a similar kind of crowdsource, um, uh, you know, research. And then maybe this fall, sometimes I'll get out there to visit, and we'll you know we'll tour a few places, and we can do a little seminar. You know, great. But if you're in the area, place. can they just drop into the Merrick Center and see this thing now? I saw it on the news. I saw it on on social media like yesterday or today. Yeah, Brad has posted it, and I forwarded. I posted it on a couple Facebook pages. Uh, Brad is going to have a piece in the forward, hopefully in the next week or two. Uh, I just he just asked. I just sent him some quotes <laughs> that he could use, um, and then after the forward post runs, I will write a blog post which will give my sort of perspective and a larger put it in context. Um, but I imagine you can stop by and see it. And I would yeah, urge you well, to do Well, particularly if the window is open. You just go through the window. <laughs> no one will mind. Yeah. Bring your camera uh, call. with you. I think you should call first. Oh, okay, uh, you, call I, never, I, I never show up at a synagogue anymore without announcing. Yeah, don't break windows, uh, please. I, I, don't always want Dr. Email, I always email and call first um, and explain why and where. Because uh, synagogues, for good reason, get very nervous when people start come and take pictures without permission and that kind of thing. But if you say you're interested in the art, I think they'll they'll be very excited. Uh, they don't know whether they're gonna keep it or not. Uh, they don't know, we're gonna see if we can, we may end up doing some crowdsourcing for funding to at least get the money to do a conservation uh, study. We need to get a conservator out there to look at it. And I don't think the synagogue really wants to spend money <laughs> So if they can keep it and it doesn't cost much, they probably will. But if it costs a lot, then you know, then we'll have to we'll have to see what happens. Okay. Well, stay tuned for more. We'll see you guys uh, next week at this time for the finale. And but hopefully, I'll see you sooner tomorrow. Um, I guess we're going to Crimea. I'm going to Crimea with some of you. So be safe. Be safe if you're going we to will, Crimea. We will. Yeah. Okay. Will. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. See you later. Bye, Vimya. <laughs>